go. Hi, Brian. Hi, Will. How you doing? I'm doing great. You are out in uh, Los Angeles, I understand. Yes, I am. I'm in the Reason Magazine offices in uh, West L.A. Well, uh, that's appropriate. I'm in the Cato Institute offices in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, two more libertarian institutions it would be difficult to imagine. Indeed. Um, I, I used to work in that uh, same office. Well, probably not the same office, but the same building that you're in. Oh, yeah. Well, when did you work at Cato, Brian? I, uh, I worked at Cato from uh, the summer of 91 through the summer of 94, which actually spanned the time in which Cato moved into that uh, glorious glass edifice <laughs> that you report to uh, daily. So, yeah, I, w I was one of the big guys who moved into that place. Oh, wow. Well, so what year did it open? Uh, 93. I believe, I believe it was May of 93, but uh, either late spring or early summer. Well, I wish I could uh, give our viewers a tour of the Cato Institute, but my camera's, you know, locked down. It, but it is, a, but it is a lovely building. I've never been to the Reason offices in uh, in L.A., um, so I can't say what they're like. Uh, are they? It uh, is a lovely building. We we don't have the whole building though. We're merely a uh, sort of a half floor suite. Uh, Reason is a very uh, uh, wired and uh, tele telecom happy uh, organization and very few of us actually physically gather in the same place uh, at any time and most of my colleagues are in DC actually yeah well I've, uh, I'm frequently at the DC office um, but we're here today Brian to talk about your book uh, radicals for capitalism subtitle being a freewheeling history of the modern American Libertarian movement, um, showing it to the camera. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a handsome volume and and Thank you. and thick. It's comprehensive. Um, Brian, uh, will, will you tell uh, the uh, blogging head viewers um, briefly why uh, they should care about the history of libertarianism? Uh, you and I uh, are sort of career libertarians, uh, so obviously this is in some sense our story, which is one of the reasons why I was delighted by the book. Uh, it gave me a sense of historical perspective of, about the institutions that I've uh, worked in. Um, but uh, why should someone who's, uh, uh, you know, you know, has no particular interest in libertarianism per se, uh, why, why, why would they be interested in this book? Um, uh, on a literary level, I, I will start by saying libertarians are, are really interesting characters uh, with uh, stress on the word character, especially in the uh, early days of the movement uh, that uh, my book focuses on. Uh, it took a particular kind of personality to even be a libertarian in, uh, in the American context in the, the mid-40s and 50s and 60s. Uh, uh, when the whole modern movement started. I mean, the rest of the world was not supporting or encouraging you in, uh, you know, believing in radical, uh, radical extensions of the notions of, of free minds and free living. In fact, the world was, was pretty much telling you you were insane and in some cases telling you that you, you were tantamount to being a criminal. There's a couple of stories I tell in my book involving... Uh, uh, FBI investigations of uh, libertarian figures for, for daring to express in a, uh, a postcard that an officious postmaster read that they uh, didn't believe Social Security was a good idea. Or, oh, good or lord. Being, uh, or being uh, called, called to the mat before a pre-McCarthy uh, congressional commission called the Buchanan Committee that was investigating uh, lobbying uh, that really felt there was something nearly seditious about believing, say, that there shouldn't be a military draft or that mm. uh, the government shouldn't be nationalizing a steel mill. So for those reasons, uh, it took a very self-willed, quirky, eccentric type to fight for libertarian ideas. And I think even, even if you don't grant the importance of libertarian ideas, which I'll get to in a second, mm -hmm. I think a lot of readers will, will find uh, the book amusing to read merely for, uh, say, characters like Joseph Galambos, who took his belief in intellectual property uh, to the radical extreme that he didn't believe any of his students had the right to uh, pass on or explain any of his ideas. Uh, he believed <laughs> intellectual property was not only an absolute right, but mm -hmm. an inalienable one. Which uh, would help explain why nobody's ever heard of it. Has heard of Joseph <laughs> Galambos, indeed. Uh, or uh, or R.C. Hoyles, uh, the publisher of uh, what is now the Orange County Register, uh -huh. uh, one of the only uh, newspaper publishers in California who... Uh, 
who editorialized against the internment of the Japanese, who, uh, though he was a very stolid bourgeois businessman himself, he, he delighted in, uh, in telling people that he, he believed that whorehouses were a, uh, a more respectable institution than public schools, since people who went to whorehouses went there of their own will, uh, which is not <laughs> the case with public schools. Um, so, so there's that aspect. Not, not likely to be a, a popular position rhetorically. Uh, exactly. So yeah. there's there's the, the color aspect, and also um, uh, to, to get to the sort of more idea framing, I, okay. I, I do believe that uh, libertarian ideas have been far more important both for the American political present and promise to be more significant in the American political future than you would guess given how much serious attention it's gotten so far from political scientists or, or right. political historiographers. Um, there's dozens and dozens of books uh, about every little twist and turn in domestic American communist uh, politics and, and an ever-growing number of books about the standard American right wing whose story yeah. does intersect with the libertarian one in some interesting ways. But uh, with only a couple of exceptions, and, and none of them very recent, that no one has, has tried to write the book I wrote, a, a comprehensive, serious uh Quasi, I mean, I, I consider it a work of, of journalism as opposed to a work of scholarship, but there's a fair amount of scholarly apparatus uh, in it. Uh, there is. For 100 pages of end notes, uh, and I, I think I did a pretty good job. I mean, you can look at certain aspects of, uh, you pick Milton Friedman, for example, a great mm -hmm. uh, libertarian hero, uh, such a great libertarian hero that the uh, conservative movement uh, is always trying to claim him for their own, a, a grasp that he, he attempted happen. To elude uh, whenever whenever he could, he he knew he was a libertarian. Uh, um, look at how many aspects of the modern world his fingerprints uh, have marked. From the fact that we now have a uh, volunteer army. I mean, any any young man or probably nowadays even woman who have not been drafted into the army in the last twenty years really has Milton Friedman directly to thank. As I explain in my book, he was the intellectual firepower behind the uh, Gates Commission that uh, gave Nixon the arguments and cover he needed to, to end the draft in uh, 73, mm -hmm. a couple of years later than Friedman uh, wanted him to. The commission report came out in 70, I believe, and Friedman thought it should be eliminated immediately. Nixon was a little slow. Um, you know, and while the Federal Reserve never really followed every uh, jot and tittle of Friedman's monetarist prescriptions uh, to the letter, mm -hmm. the, the general notion that uh, the Fed needed to stop increasing the money supply is, is something that Friedman was the greatest uh, explainer and advocate for in, uh, in the 70s and 80s. And so the fact that the dollars in our pocket are are worth within a few percentage points of what they were a year ago for the last decade or so, I think you can largely... Uh, lay at his feet. Uh, so uh, the the Reagan Revolution, everything about it that I think actually excited people uh, mm -hmm. was was pretty much uh, taken from uh, libertarian rather than conservative roots. Uh, you know what you remember about Reagan is not uh, the religious right stuff or any kind of traditionalism or conservatism, but uh, really his 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 pushing the idea that the government had had grown too big, was managing too much, was taxing too much, was spending too much. He didn't really do much about any of those things, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, I think that's what got him where he was, and this is all really libertarian stuff. So. Uh, Libertarianism, and, and especially in the web age, and especially for younger uh, people, I think you, you do see it as, as an ideology on the grow, as they say, and one whose, uh, whose history mm -hmm. needed to be told. So. It, really, it really is quite salient uh, on the Internet. A lot of times people uh, uh, on the Internet, maybe even commenters in Blogging Heads TV, we'll, we'll see on the comment thread that shows up for this video, uh, th there's uh, a lot of people like, why do we have to listen to so much libertarian stuff on the internet mm -hmm. uh you know, the, you know like because you know reasonable people don't believe these things but yet uh, libertarian bloggers keep uh, cropping up uh, all over the place uh, uh i keep having to see you know things from the cato institute or reason um and so uh, it, it, so there's this i, th I think still a, a pretty widespread perception that uh libertarianism is a, a somewhat crazy marginal ideology but at the same time, it's crazy and marginal in a way that's difficult to avoid, at least in certain sort of levels of American culture. So there, there is, I, I sense kind of a tension there that either libertarianism is or isn't marginalized, and if it is a marginal ideology, then why do people have to constantly 
complain about why they see it so much. Exactly. It has, uh, there, there's that phrase, which I believe is attributed to Gandhi, though I have no idea if he said it, you know, maybe Lincoln or Einstein or Mark Twain or any of those other people who said everything, said it about how, you know, first, uh, first they ignore you, then they fight you, then they, you know, and, and then you win. Uh, and I think libertarianism definitely is to the, uh, uh, then they fight you stage, and I would say when I first got into this stuff, professional libertarian activism in the late 80s, early 90s, we were still firmly in the they ignore you stage, and uh, I do believe uh, on the on the marginality spectrum, we've at least moved into uh, they're arguing with you and fighting you stage, and uh, mm -hmm. you know maybe uh, as some this is not my joke and I wish I remembered who it was someone on the internet noted that perhaps it will occur to them that they should just go back to ignoring you because that was working out better and uh, um, I yeah, think well, I, I, I confront that a lot is the is the uh, you get into an argument about uh, the argument is about why I should be able to ignore you yeah exactly and, and so it, uh, but but of course if you're having that argument uh, you've already lost it um, uh, so, so, so you might as well just go ahead and have the substantive argument. Uh, but then, having the substantive argument, you know, arguing a position on its merits, then uh, requires that you attribute the position uh, and your interlocutor uh, some degree of respect and credibility. And 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 that's that can be perceived as a kind of defeat. If you have to confer some respect and credibility on your sort of debate partner, um, then then you can't just dismiss them. And, and so the, and I think that I think there's something maybe we're on that cusp uh, where uh, people feel like maybe they've lost the argument that they can't dismiss you. Um, so um, but, but there's still some sense of frustration about that. Yeah, in, there's in one certain of the, quarters. This is something I, I think I get into very early in my book. Uh, libertarian thinkers as diverse as uh, Friedman and uh, Murray Rothbard, uh, who, who feuded. Uh, about many, many things, both agreed that uh, libertarian victories were, were probably in the short term not likely to come because uh, a wide range of people had actually been convinced of the rightness of the entire libertarian ideological package, but it would come by libertarians being able to provide uh, libertarian solutions to crises that would arise in the status ways of doing things, and I, I, I think um, we can we can posit that certain very constitutive aspects of the the giant state of the 20th century uh, we can kind of see them coming to an, an end whether it be the the entitlement state uh, you know Medicare Medicaid Social Security it's becoming more and more clear that they need at least a very thorough rethinking if not a demolition and uh, I am at least hoping that a lot of people are beginning to see that. Uh, Overseas adventurism is 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 not really work, ever working out the way people planned, and right. maybe people will begin turning away from that in droves. So the American people do have a distressing tendency to, um, of course, they always get very tired of of the losing war uh, after it's become clear how losing it is, and then <laughs> yeah. uh, twenty years later they're perfectly happy to one. go along uh, with the next one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that that actually br brings us to an issue that I, that that I, that I wanted to discuss. Maybe you can go into some of the history of this. I, I, we, we're not going to go uh, linearly through the history or chronologically. Um, the, so, um, I, and again, I run into this constantly. Um, uh, it's, a con it's a kind of an institutional pet peeve for the Cato Institute where uh, when we're, newspapers refer to us, so you'll get the conservative Cato Institute sure. or the, or the right-wing Cato Institute. And libertarians are often identified with the right uh, um, no doubt partly because of uh, libertarians' part in the you know, anti-communist coalition of the 20th century. Um, right. But uh, can, can you explain like, briefly uh, what the relationship of contemporary libertarianism is sure. with the right in yeah, America? Yeah, I, I can talk through how the, what you might call the libertarian right-wing split occurred. It's a big part of the story my book tells. Um, in the late 40s and early 50s, as you alluded, there, there really wasn't such a clear-cut, understood distinction on the part of the people who actually were part of uh, 
the sort of anti-Roosevelt, anti-New Deal, uh, individualist coalition. They, uh, you know, if, if you read the letters and writings of, of people like Ayn Rand or, or Leonard Reed, who founded uh, the Foundation for Economic Education, the first explicitly modern libertarian uh, educational group, um, until the mid-50s, they, they too would often uh, refer to themselves as either conservative or, or of the right. Uh, they, they didn't quite understand yet what the difference was. And uh, William Buckley and Russell Kirk both were major right-wing figures who really helped the libertarians understand that they were a different animal uh, for various different reasons. Kirk, of course, because of his uh, uh, powerful, almost absurdly powerful traditionalism and, uh, and lack of appreciation for urbanity, modernity, and free markets. He had a, a very almost quasi-medieval view of what a proper human life was like, you know, mm -hmm. rooted in author communities of authority and rank ordering and all that. Um, yeah. He, Kirk, from the beginning, understood that he didn't like uh, the libertarians um, among him to, to the degree that uh, he initially refused to be on the masthead of the National Review because Frank Meyer, uh, one of these uh, ex-communists, mm -hmm with more libertarian leanings than most of the other National Review founders, was also on the masthead. Kirk hated Meyer so much he didn't want to be associated with him at all. Um, but the, the main issue that caused the split, and it was good that we had that sort of war segue in, was mm -hmm. um, the Cold War and, and what the proper American individualist attitude towards international communism should be. And, of course, from the beginning... Uh, and even before the beginning, Buckley very strongly believed that fighting and defeating international communism was the issue. In fact, in uh, about a year before um, National Review launched, Buckley wrote an article in the more libertarian-leaning magazine, The Freeman, edited by Frank Chodorov, uh, a wonderful article which I, I quote at length in my book, in which, which he lays out exactly how and why the uh, that anti-New Deal coalition was going to split into a right-wing and a libertarian uh, phase, and basically the right-wingers thought uh, nothing mattered more than actual all-out war uh, against the communists, and um, the people who ended up being on the libertarian side of that divide, sort of led uh, by Chodorov himself and by Leonard Reed of Fee, um, did not believe that international communism was a menace that uh, the United States government needed to or ought to uh, be fighting. Uh, there's a quote from Leonard Reed, uh, I might not be getting exactly right, I mm -hmm. think it's actually on the back of my book, about how communism is, uh, is a, an idea to be sort of argued and explained away. It is not a threat to be you know, shot away or blown away. And, uh, so what was that? Was, his, uh, was Reed's idea that communism wasn't a serious threat based in some uh, sort of philosophical or economic conception of why communism are, wouldn't be successful or sustainable? Yeah, there are, uh, both sorts of arguments fed in. Uh, one, and this is, is, is most clearly expressed in this great homiletic pamphlet Reed wrote called Conscience on the Battlefield, that it was actually, there were serious moral issues with going overseas to blow people to bits uh, because you were unhappy with uh, their government. He, he did not believe that uh, international communism was a direct military threat to the United States, and he believed in the long run, largely influenced by the writings of Ludwig von Mises, uh, the great libertarian economist, that uh, because central planning, to the extent the Soviets tried to follow it, was uh, so economically inefficient that uh, in, in the long run the Soviet Union would not be able to outcompete the U.S. either economically or militarily. As Rose Wilder Lane uh, put it uh, colorfully, she, she didn't believe you know that she said that the instant uh, you you let these uh, the the Soviets let their soldiers cross the borders, uh, you know they'd they'd all defect. Uh, it didn't work out entirely that way, but that was a general idea that communism was was so miserable and so inefficient that it in practice it would not uh, serve to be a real threat to the United States, and that morally also there were issues with uh, you know taxing and uh, uh, U.S. citizens to go overseas and. Uh, and blow people up. As, as Chodorov put it in the Korean War context, you know, what we call, uh, what we, what many right-wingers called going overseas to fight communism should more accurately be called going overseas to slaughter natives. And uh, he did not believe that that was a right thing to do or a necessary thing to do. And and, and that was uh, the big division. It, it made the right-wingers sort of think of libertarians as... Uh, 
you know, airy fairy, uh, head in the clouds types who didn't understand the important issues of geopolitics. Mm-hmm. I think you're seeing that same thing today in the uh, the war on mm-hmm. uh, Islamism context. Yeah, that, you just uh, don't uh, people who just don't understand the existential crisis. Exactly. That we're fighting, and, and that and that if you don't pay attention, if you don't, you know, if, if we don't commit all our resources and energy and will, that uh, that, that that we're, you know, threatened with extinction. Um, exactly. And, and and but those of us who just don't think sort of Islamist terrorism is that big of a deal, we, we're right. just assumed to be, uh, you know, shallow, uh, naive. And so forth. So it's basically the same thing about the communist threat. How how much of the how how much of the uh, the right wing animus towards so part of it has to be based in the idea that communism is a serious was a serious uh, uh, threat, which which sure. means that that, that 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 at some level you had to think that uh, that that the communist system of you know economic and social planning. Uh, was viable and, in fact, a powerful alternative to uh, to uh, to a liberal society. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and, yeah. But, I've, but secondarily, uh, then, then on top of that, you'd have to. I think how much of the uh, fear of the communist menace had to do with just the the, the idea of the of the godlessness of communism, uh, or or the how much of it had to do with the sort of internationalist. Aspect of communism, where uh, sure. they sort of were in favor of eroding uh, kind of national character, and how much yeah. of it had to do with the the idea that these were sort of uh, you know godless rationalists. Yeah, that that actually, you know, I don't actually go into that aspect of it much in my book, but now that you brought it up, and I'm, I'm thinking on the fly, I, I think mm-hmm. that did have a great deal to do with it because another sort of great moment in the. Uh, the right-wing libertarian split was the way National Review chose to review Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, which came out in 57, a book that was, you know, absolutely adored by all the libertarians who were already extant and became a very significant uh, uh, sort of prompt to many libertarians of the mm-hmm. future uh, because of its extremely grim and relentless explanation of exactly what was going to happen to a world that uh, didn't realize how important, uh, you know, limited government was? Of course, to Rand, it it was it went much deeper than the limited government part, but that was the part right. that uh, most libertarians are focused on. And uh, National Review uh, was appalled by this book and had Whitaker Chambers, the the former communist, uh, you know, the guy who uh, who exposed Alger Hiss uh, to the world, mm-hmm. wrote this extremely a pretty infamous uh, review of uh, basically saying that he detected, uh, you know, the, the stench of fascism uh, in Rand. The she, he could hear a voice commanding to the gas chamber go. And one of the things that most alarmed the National mm-hmm. Review types about Rand was that same godless rationalism that they that they hated in the commies. And there were really there were very few serious orthodox traditional Christians or Catholics amongst the big leading lights of the early libertarian days. A lot of them, Leonard Reed had an extremely eccentric uh, bent toward uh, Eastern mysticism, uh, sort of portmanteau uh, Eastern mysticism of a sort. Uh, a lot of his associates, and this is a, a very fun story I tell yeah. in my book, uh, were early experimenters with uh, psychedelic drugs as part of their their exploration into uh, I, I curious... love this bit of the book, like uh, yeah. we because because these these guys who were sort of like getting into like you know you know dropping acid and tripping were like were like members of like you know upstanding members of the chamber of commerce exactly right? you and, had... and, and the, so I imagine these like fifties guys in gray flannel suits uh, you know just like. Uh, you know, tripping balls in Leonard Reed's living room or something like that. It would be a, it, it's just kind of a great image. I, I, I will say that I did not find authoritative proof that Leonard himself uh, did acid. Right, right. I have my suspicions that he did, but certainly some of his associates, including uh, the guy who turned Reed on to libertarianism, uh, W.C. Mullendore, who was a, a vice president at SoCal Edison, definitely was. Uh, James Inga Bretson, a high powered LA lawyer. Uh, who who ran this libertarian religious group called Faith and Freedom in the fifties? Uh, definitely did, and 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 Reed Reed led these guys at least in, into the whole uh, Eastern religion thing. Uh, he he explicitly denied in one of his journals uh, 
that he had ever done LSD, but uh, I don't necessarily take everything in those journals seriously yeah. because he, he knew and intended that his children would be reading them, so it mm. may well be that certain things he he didn't uh, want his kids to know. But uh, the, the general point is, yeah, there, there were... And uh, Robert Lefebvre, another... Uh, a very important early libertarian actually had been this votary in this bizarre cult called the uh, the Great I Am, uh, which was a bit of a craze in the late 30s and early 40s. And uh, he lived this sort of uh, Heinleinian life where he had a wife, and he also had this gaggle of four women associates who just kind of followed him around everywhere. Hmm. And, uh, you know, he insisted there was nothing, uh, he insisted it wasn't what you think, but uh, it, 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 it still uh, turned yeah. a lot of people off. The, 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 as I started off, this is a curious bunch of characters, and, and very few of them uh, uh, yes. seriously, traditionally Christian. Yeah, you had to be almost, uh, you know, by definition, nonconformist if you were going to be toying with these ideas. So Exactly. Um, the uh, So... Uh, Interesting question. Let's let's go back to Ayn Rand for a second. Sure. Um, uh, with with regard to communism, so some of the early, uh, uh, so one of the splits with the right had to do with uh, the people like Leonard Reed uh, not seeing the fight against communism as uh, an essential uh, aspect of, uh, you know, just, uh, th- that that wasn't a, that the communists weren't such a big threat. Now Ayn Rand, um, who was uh, Born and raised in the Soviet Union, uh, she was vehemently anti-communist yeah. and seems to have considered it a threat. Even though she also, I mean, she I, um, she agrees with the idea, agreed with the idea that it was not viable in the long run. Um, right. But, but she and her uh, and you know her associates on down the line uh, to her sort of like intellectual heirs to the day um, are, are actually. Qu- relatively militant relative to uh, other libertarians. You want to explain that? Yeah, Rand uh, Rand did, uh, and uh, I'm just going to try to explain this uh, rather than uh, defend it. She she had mm-hmm. this weirdly unindividualistic notion that um, we, as as sort of the freest government on earth, had the moral right, though not the moral obligation. To sort of you know blow less free governments to bits. It really is a, almost almost right. like a, the Bush doctrine in a sense. But uh, yeah. she she her followers have made much more of that really than she ever did. She, yeah. she never made it one of her main points out. And thus we we need to be fighting wars overseas against the communists. She she did think they were the worst evil on earth. But because of her philosophy, she did believe that before any of this could change, you had to change everyone's metaphysics and then work up from there. So so she understood that a military solution to the problem of communism was, was never going to actually be effective because you had to eradicate communism where it began, which was in the false premises and in individual human minds. Uh, um, so that was why she never was enough of a cold warrior to to thrill the Buckleys of the world. But mm-hmm. but uh, as you brought up earlier, it was probably her own uh, godless rationalism uh, that, that made them hate her more than anything. Um, mm-hmm. You see a certain... The attitude uh, which you find in the correspondence between your Buckleys and your Reeds and your Buckleys and your Rothbards in, in that first decade of National Review was, was, was kind of more patronizing than anything else. Uh, I mean, Buckley did understand where libertarians were coming from. He... He did mostly believe what they believed about uh, about you know taxation, free markets, uh, and the like. Uh, he just thought they were you know goofily naive about the threat, the military threat that international communism posed. Uh, and you know, being Buckley and a, a, a charming patrician man, uh, it was uh, you know it was actually amusing to read some of these things. There's a great uh, sort of a rant of sorts from uh, a guy named E.W. Dykes, who was the chairman of the board of Fee in the early 60s, mm-hmm. where he directly tries to grapple with the fact that the right-wingers thought, oh, you you know, you know, libertarians with your silly intellectual seminars about demunicipalizing the garbage service while, <laughs> while the real issue is international communism. He wrote this great rant about how um, we will never be able to uh, solve any of the larger political problems of our time until we get to the root of of why it is wrong to municipalize the garbage service. And uh, I, I find it very convincing because Damn he's like, you, you, you ask us to come in, at the, us libertarians, to come in at the end of this 
incredibly long line of statist errors and then go, oh, well, how is your libertarianism going to solve this problem? It's like, well, it's too late to solve this late problem. We really have to work back and solve the problems from the beginning. I, I felt the same way after 9-11 when, you know, you get the accusations. You might have heard them as well. It's like, oh, how how is your BS libertarian non-interventionism going to going to deal with this. And right. I'm like, well, I don't know, but maybe there wouldn't be this if we had been following more libertarian foreign policy principles uh, down the line. Yeah, let's, let's back up a minute, and because, uh, uh, of course, your book covers, uh, you know, a, a lot of ground, uh, um, you know, starts well before the 20th century. Um, and I wanted to talk uh, just briefly about, uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about the transition into the 20th century. There's a lot of interesting characters uh, in the 19th century, uh, radical individualists and anarchists, whom uh, libertarians uh, often claim as, as uh, forebears, that are uh, mostly ignored in history. People like Benjamin Tucker, Lysander mm-hmm. Spooner, uh, uh, Hosea Warren, thing, people like that. Um, uh, and and and, and uh, that, now uh, I think a lot of Americans like have some sense that there's something sort of kind of libertarian-ish about uh, some of the American founding fathers, but they seem not to be as aware of this extremely radical uh, individualist anti-statist tradition uh, in American history through the 19th century. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I find uh, I, I'm more and more drawn to learning more about that uh, that that uh, part of sure. history. As as a matter of sort of historiography, I I I've come to be convinced that if it weren't for uh, certain libertarians, specifically James J. Martin, uh, who who had a later very unfortunate turn toward uh, toward uh, affection for uh, Holocaust revisionism, uh, but before that, uh, wrote wrote a very good book uh, called. Uh, called uh, Men Against the State that told these people stories, and Murray Rothbard really kept them alive, that almost no one would remember these people you're talking about. Uh, uh, sort of their their linchpin was a guy named Benjamin Tucker in a, a journal he edited from, I think, like 1881-ish to 1908 uh, called Liberty, and there's a libertarian magazine today uh, that carries on that title, though there wasn't a, a direct uh, lineage. And... Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, they were uh, what could be called individualist anarchists. They were working in a, a sort of social and intellectual context where they were surrounded by uh, sort of communist anarchists and socialists. And many of them even called themselves socialists in the sense that they were trying to solve the same problem that the socialists uh, were trying to solve. Uh, they were very mindful of the plight of the working man uh, and all that. They were by no means defenders of plutocracy or government, but uh, Tucker and uh, the people surrounding him happened to believe that the problems the socialists were trying to solve would be best solved uh, by eliminating, uh, uh, Tucker called them the four monopolies, and I, I hope I can remember to reel off all four of them, but, uh, uh, but Go it, for it. at any rate, he, he blamed all four of these monopolies basically on the state and believed that if the state had disappeared, the monopolies of, of finance, and, and yeah, I'm not going to remember the four of them, but at any rate, he thought that if we got rid of the state, we'd be getting rid of, of, of all of these things that sort of held the working man down and prevented mm-hmm. everyone from living uh, the richest uh, life that they could. And um, and uh, th- they had some of their main differences with, uh, with modern libertarians is that they had certain economic theories about currency and banking and uh, in some cases about land. Uh, there was a big Henry George line running mm-hmm. through these things where they thought that, that maybe private, like, Absentee property and land was was not considered necessarily on the up and up by a yeah. lot of a, a lot of these people. They felt that you, you needed to actually occupy the land to be considered to own it. So so that's why there's there's certainly a a lot of modern left libertarians who really would gripe about what you might call mainstream libertarianism of the Cato reason variety as, yeah. as really ignoring the wisdom of of the Tuckerites, and in many cases, whether it be wisdom or not, it's certainly true uh, that most modern libertarians uh, do ignore it. I've, I've actually been called to task by various uh, people that I didn't give enough attention to that left libertarian line and libertarianism. But the reason I didn't really is because I, I was writing a, a, a descriptive, not a prescriptive history. And, and while it is true that modern libertarians are 
are about the only ones who honor and remember Tucker and his crew, it is also true that uh, we have not, uh, you know, it's not that we libertarians think what they do because they read Tucker. In almost every right. case, it's sort of doing intellectual archaeology where, where people... Uh, come upon Tucker. Um, no, I, like I, I, you know, a lot of these people are still, you know, influential through these sort of like chains of influence. Like, uh, for instance, uh, Tucker. I, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, t- Tucker was, I, I, I think I remember, it, it influenced by the sort of obscure German philosopher Max Stirner. Yes, who was a, a, a radical individualist of the most extreme sort, uh, to the extent of thinking that. Uh, that following the norms of your language uh, could be a kind yeah. of constraint. Now, there, like that, that kind of uh, the and so like and so, Stirner was very much into a sort of individual liberation at a vi- at, at a very radical level. That individuals needed to um, uh, divest themselves of all convention that got in the way of their realizing whatever it is that they wanted to do. Indeed, and, and then and, and that. That sort of view was actually sort of popularized in the early '70s by people like Harry Brown. Uh, yeah, uh, that like uh, he, uh, uh, his, his, his books were a kind of pop Stirnerism. So like his book, uh, "How to Be Free in an Unfree World." Uh, and exactly. For those of you who don't know who Harry Brown is, he uh, he, he he was the Libertarian candidate for president uh, on two different separate occasions, um, and uh, you know it had has had some uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, relatively large influence on the sort of contemporary libertarian movement. So, the, so, so these influences from the sort of radical individualists like Tucker kind of live on in these these currents that that still wind their way through the libertarian movement. That's totally true. The Sternerism got got buried for a long time because Sterner was radically amoral as well, and mm-hmm. uh, most uh, your sort of Rand Rothbard strain of libertarianism was very obsessed with morality, ethics, and rights, and your sort of more utilitarian Mises Friedman strain at least wasn't actively hostile, hostile uh, to the notion of morality, but Sterner, mm-hmm. Sterner was, and in fact there was a big controversy amongst the Tucker circle, because Tucker, Tucker came into Sterner uh, sort of halfway through his intellectual career. Mm-hmm. Tucker had started off as a sort of rights-based guy, and he turned to Sternerism uh, later on, and it really upset a lot of his colleagues who really felt that... Uh, it was sort of a operationally and rhetorically bad move to to link these already uh, radical and despised ideas about uh, freedom in the state to uh, amoralism, which is, is mm-hmm. even more unpopular. But uh, as you noted, uh, Harry Brown, uh, one of the most successful uh, popular writers uh, as far as libertarian ideas go, both with his uh, hard money advice books mm-hmm. and uh, that philosophy book you mentioned, how I sort of pop philosophy, how I found freedom in an unfree world, uh, very explicitly were returning to the sort of amoralism. Uh, you know, uh, Brown would talk about you know the the friendship trap, <laughs> the marriage trap. Yeah, you, just you, like, you get married. Let it all go. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Like and, don't, uh, don't and, get trapped, man. It's all a trap. You know, it's, exactly. a, it's something that's sort of like appealing to. A kind of hippie mentality, that, and the funny thing is, like, he's a guy. He's like, a, you know, an investment guy. Yeah, but uh, he's giving this kind of like semi hippieish advice, but it's not peace, love, understanding advice. Right. It's, it's this sort of individual, amoralist sort of advice. Like, don't get caught in the trap of you know meeting obligations to your children. Exactly. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because it's another sort of plug for how influential libertarianism has been. I mean, the entire you know the '70s is is well known as, as sort of the me self actualization decade, and two of the leading gurus of that, uh, one Harry Brown, who we've just been talking about, and the second mm-hmm. Robert Ringer, the author of right. Looking Out for Number One. These two guys who had massive bestsellers, really helping sort of set the stage for the whole me self actualization decade. Both radical libertarians, both very successful. Uh, perhaps coincidentally and perhaps not, neither of them really wave the label much. Um, yeah. I'm not sure you can even find the word libertarian in either of their books, but they absolutely arose from the libertarian movement and were politically libertarian. And also were both uh, hard money obsessives. Uh, um, both of them came from the investment advice world. And, you know, if anyone... I really feel this has been a poorly documented and poorly remembered aspect of late 70s, early 80s culture. The whole... Uh, the entire economy is about to collapse. You all need to, you know, retreat to the woods with your gold coins and your, uh, your right. weapons and your food. Uh, 
It was a very popular little movement then, and, and very much driven by libertarians. I mean, if you're going to find any movement based on the notion that government is screwing up the economy so badly that we all need to stock up on canned foods, uh, you're sure to find libertarians <laughs> at the heart of it. Let, let's, let's jump back to the 19th century again for a minute. Now, now, one of the things that comes through in the book that, that you know, my identifying as a libertarian that I, that I, that I felt a sense of pride in is, is this sense that, um, that uh, as opposed to sort of most of the other ideologies that were dominant in the 20th century, like, like uh, you know, the certain kinds of conservatism, certain kinds of uh, radical leftism, that, that libertarians have kind of clean hands. You know, uh, libertarians never were in favor of uh, uh, you know, n n never were boosters for dictators like Stalin or, or you know, like National Review would get themselves into being a booster for sort of Catholic fascists just as long yeah. as they were anti-communist. And so, yes. so, so, so most of the sort of like mainstreams of American politics have some sort of, you know, like if you, if you go into the backlog of the New Republic or, uh, or in, in National Review, you can find embarrassing things. Yeah. Um, you can find embarrassing things by libertarians, but none of them are actually apologetics for uh, uh, for uh, genocides or anything like that. Uh, now, uh, so it's kind of nice to have the sense that, that at least you did no harm by sanctioning uh, sort of uh, you know major um, sort of evil kinds of uh, uh, political regimes. But uh, what, one thing I noticed in your chapter on uh, sort of the 19th century was um, some sort of credit taking on the libertarian side for uh, things like um, uh, uh, certain abolitionists, certain sure. sort of like uh, 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 early feminist thinkers, and, uh, and 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 it occurs to me that some people would uh, w would probably resist the idea that. There's some sense in which the abolitionists or early feminists count as libertarian rather than liberal in a broader sense. So, in what sense do you think, like uh, uh, that, uh, that that the abolitionists and feminists from the 19th century count as libertarian? Yeah, um, I understand both sides of that argument. I mean, on 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 a simple level, what is a more libertarian cause than than fighting for you know the the, the manu manumission of slaves? If mm -hmm. if you if you wanted to say well, uh, you know, they weren't, uh, William Lloyd Garrison wasn't necessarily a believer in a, an, a, an absolute unrestricted uh, free market. I, I actually, honestly, am not enough of a Garrison scholar to even know if, if, if that is true or not. But uh, there was a ferment uh, amongst, um, amongst everyone who was sort of fighting against awful constitutive elements of 19th century politics or culture from from slavery uh, to the role of women to uh, you know freedom of expression when it came to sexual matters um, to to more radical uh, anarchism anti-statism socialist anarchism and libertarian a anarchism these people were all part of uh, of a community of intellectual affinity I mean Lysander Spooner uh, an undeniably absolutely modern libertarian figure, you know, was, was also a major figure uh, in, in the abolition movement. Like Sp Sanders of, Spooner was the guy who said, the Constitution doesn't apply to me because I didn't sign it. Uh, exactly. It right. doesn't apply to him, and it doesn't apply to you. It doesn't mm -hmm. apply to any of us. Um, uh, so it, 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 is, it is unequivocally the case that people who clearly are libertarian in the modern sense, like Spooner, were significant abolitionist figures. It doesn't mean that every abolitionist... Uh, was across the board libertarian in, in the modern sense, um, but certainly to the extent that they were abolitionists, uh, they were libertarian. That's a, that's a libertarian victory that fortunately we won. Uh, people do now understand that uh, uh, you cannot uh, own another human being. So, so uh, I, I think it's it's perfectly fair uh, to claim them as part of a libertarian heritage. Though, as I think my book makes clear. Um, what is obviously and unarguably modern American libertarianism pretty much starts in the 40s. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the tracing I do back before that is is tracing of roots and influences and confluences uh, that, that kind of came in. And, and I will defend that everyone who I discuss in my book are precursors in various ways. But, uh, yeah, anything past the 40s uh, certainly uh, is up for reasonable argument about whether you can label them you know, libertarian in, in the full uh, modern sense. Okay, well, let's let's ju let's jump back uh, to the to the forties briefly. Then, 
So, the, so there were a number of key organizations that that uh, that uh, you know I think are arguably the the sort of source of the contemporary uh, libertarian uh, intellectual and political scene. Um, the would you say the first of which is the was is fee? Would that be the yeah, I, Foundation I, I, for Economic I, Education? Yes, I do mark the Foundation for Economic Education as the first obvious and explicitly and understandably modern American libertarian uh, organization. They, uh, they, they came out of uh, the Mises and Hayek uh, Austrian economic tradition. Uh, one of their very first pamphlets was written by Milton Friedman and uh, George Stigler. Ayn Rand and uh, Rose Wilder Lane and uh, Isabel Patterson were were great intellectual mentors to Leonard Reed. They really were pushing the full uh, free markets all the way. Um, you, uh, the, the, you know, there's a great phrase that Leonard Reed had, three words that sum up his mission and sum up to me the mission of modern libertarianism, which is he's for anything that's peaceful. You know, mm-hmm. he didn't believe government should be restricting your free choices in your personal life. He didn't believe government should be restricting your free choices in your economic life. Uh, that's, that's a libertarian package, and, and his was the first group pushing, pushing it in its uh, totality. Mm-hmm. So, it, so it, now, kind of down the chain, then there were some other organizations like, uh, like the uh, Institute for Humane Studies. Um, sure, that, for- that arose directly from FEE as well. Uh, F.A. Baldy Harper, who founded IHS, uh, had worked at FEE in the 50s. He actually uh, sort of ran screaming from FEE because he couldn't stand working for Leonard Reed. Uh, Leonard uh, uh, had a, a, a regrettable uh, strain of sort of central controlism when it came to his own organization. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of people who worked for him felt that uh, they were being stifled, uh, uh, both in not being able to sort of write and say everything they wanted on the anarchist end, this is actually a very interesting thing uh, I discovered uh, during the writing of this book, is um, a, a lot of non-anarchist libertarians in the current context sort of feel that uh, anarchism is this illegitimate thing that, uh, you know, Murray Rothbard smuggled into the nice Yankee Doodle constitutionalist uh, libertarian <laughs> movement. Uh, yeah. In fact... Uh, Except for Leonard Reed, pretty much every prominent libertarian figure in uh, the 50s, uh, and except for uh, Ayn Rand, and even even she's kind of a weird case, Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much were anarchists. They didn't call themselves that, though, for all the same sort of intellectual sociology reasons that modern libertarian anarchists might want to avoid the term, because it's pretty much been hijacked by the commies. But uh, Mm -hmm. R.C. Hoyles of the Orange County Register, F.A. Harper of IHS, Robert Lefebvre of the Freedom School were all anarchists, but Leonard Reed was not. So Harper, A, didn't like the fact that he wasn't able to do explicitly anarchist writing under fees, uh, Aegis, and and also kind of felt that everything moved too slow. So he left, uh, joined initially the Volcker Fund, the pretty much only major funder of libertarian causes in the uh, 40s and 50s, the group that paid for Hayek and Mises' uh, academic births in the United States, uh, when they could not get a normal uh, academic uh, gig. So Harper did that for a while, and then in a very interesting and somewhat convoluted story that I tell in my book, the Volcker Fund fell apart, and out of the ashes of it arose the Institute for Humane Studies, which is still around uh, today. Uh, when it was originally conceived, it, it, it wasn't really what it is today. It was sort of yeah. hoped it would be like uh, an equivalent of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, just a sort right. of ivory tower where great libertarian minds could uh, get paid to think deep thoughts and write deep things. It's uh, it's morphed into a sort of much more practically useful uh, organization now that that does uh, libertarian education to college undergrads mm-hmm. and sort of professional support for grad students and uh, and young. Yeah, uh, I worked for IHS for about uh, three years, I guess, and ran their grad student seminar for uh, slightly more than that. Uh, so I've got a soft spot in my, <laughs> my for IHS. And again, it was, it was, for me, it was very interesting just to read the histories of these institutions that I'd uh, spent a number of years in, which I wasn't, uh, wasn't completely fully, av- fully aware of. Uh, so to keep it on a sort of a, 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 an egocentric path, uh, it, tell us uh, a little something about the, uh, uh, the beginning of your institution, Reason Magazine, and mine, uh, the Cato Institute, how did they get started? 
Sure. Reason, um, Reason Magazine was part of a wave of uh, what we would now call zines of a libertarian nature that arose in the late 60s. Um, in, in the general groovy cultural ferment of uh, 60s campus life, uh, one of the... Uh, uh, ill-reported, until my book came along, aspects, was there was, a, you know, a, a great deal of a libertarian ferment on college campuses, and dozens of fun and funky little magazines arose, uh, only one of which is still around today, and that's Reason. It was begun by a Boston University student named Lanny Friedlander. Uh, you know, early issues had pictures of, like, guys with Molotov, Molotov cocktails on the cover, very, uh, very 60s, very neat. Uh, Friedlander yeah. sort of uh, was beginning to lose his his sort of grip on it and his ability to keep it going uh, a couple of years down the line. And uh, three fans of the magazine, uh, one of them named Robert Poole, a, a, a young engineer, uh, one Tibor Makan, a young uh, philosophy professor, a Hungarian uh, emigre, and uh, one a young lawyer in L.A. named Manny Klausner sort of formed a partnership uh, out in Southern California to take over the magazine from Friedlander. Uh, uh, they, they, they tried to make it not so much a, a, a purely internal movement magazine, but uh, the idea was it would become uh, sort of the equivalent of the Atlantic, but just with a libertarian ideological background. And uh, in 1978, they started branching out from strictly the magazine publishing aspect, and uh, particularly with Robert Poole's uh, impetus, began... Uh, uh, a think tank called the Reason Foundation in 78 mm -hmm. that uh, uh, started off very much dedicated to uh, municipal privatization ideas. Poole had, had written and edited a, a lot of books and monographs on on that topic and mm -hmm. it's sort of become uh, since then a sort of half and half organization. Uh, still does the magazine and the magazine's website for general libertarian journalism and also still does a lot of traditional think tank work um, mostly on the local and municipal level uh, regarding transportation issues, uh, waste management issues, uh, education issues and the like, sort of interjecting uh, markets, competition and the like into, uh, in, into those issues. Mm. Um, Cato, for its part, began yeah. in uh, 77. Uh, it, that's actually interesting that the Reason Foundation and Cato started in that same era. Th this mm -hmm. was really the first era when liber the libertarian movement shifted from being a purely educational movement. I mean, mm -hmm. until until the 70s, libertarianism was such a far-out idea that no libertarian had any notion of how to actually mesh libertarian ideas with the gears of the real world. Like, right. from Fee to IHS to Lefebvre's Freedom School, it was all about education, just spreading libertarian ideas to individual minds. In the 70s, you had the Libertarian Party, the Reason Foundation, and then the Cato Institute that actually, in different ways, tried to mesh the ideas with the real world. And uh, Cato uh, was begun by the man who, who uh, still runs it, uh, Ed Crane. He had, uh, Crane had been working uh, with the LP through the 70s. He was its executive director for a few years there. Mm -hmm. And even when he wasn't explicitly its executive director, he was pretty much uh, the mastermind through most of the 70s. Uh, through the LP, he had uh, met and befriended a, uh, a student of Robert Lefebvre's named uh, Charles Koch, who also, luckily for libertarianism, happened to be a uh, billionaire industrialist, uh, along with his brother David, <laughs> uh, uh, as well as a hardcore libertarian. And um, Crane and Koch, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, George Pearson, one of Koch's assistants, and Murray Rothbard, who was still in good standing with... Uh, with Crane and Coke at that time, sort of uh, mulled over the notion of creating a, uh, a full-service uh, think tank to develop and popularize uh, libertarian ideas, and it was founded as the Cato Institute, initially as sort of a, both as a nose-thumbing to the Washington establishment and also because mm -hmm. it's where Ed wanted to live. Uh, Cato started in San Francisco, where Ed had previously been an investment advisor, and it was his mm -hmm. favorite city. Uh, after four or five years, they realized that if uh, a, a political think tank was really going to mesh with both uh, government and national media, it really needed to be in D.C., so they moved to D.C. It's been there ever since. It's grown from a you know few hundred thousand dollar organization to, what, 22 million now, you guys? I mean, um, yeah, it's somewhere around uh, 20 million, I think, uh, yeah. uh, the... The uh, latest uh, 
uh, annual report is available online. <laughs> so. Yeah, so uh, Cato has done well for itself. Um, uh, Unlike Reason, which, as I said, is focused mostly on uh, local and state government issues, Cato has been a, a giant uh, every issue under the sun, from foreign policy to energy policy mm -hmm. to constitutional law issues. They, Cato really tries, you know, I don't, I don't need to be hyping Cato. Everyone knows how, how <laughs> nifty Cato is. Uh, yeah, well, uh, um, let's, uh, let, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, Ryan, and, I, and I, there's just a, one more thing that I wanted to touch on uh, is to... Uh, uh, you know, we we got through a good bit of history uh, there. Uh, one thing, uh, like you mentioned, like uh, one of the things that Cato does is is is, is foreign policy. Uh, Cato has always been stridently, uh, stridently. I don't know if that's the right word, but strongly uh, anti-war, uh, which apparently is, was surprising to some people because they when they identify Cato as right wing, they think that means that uh, sure. they're going to be in favor of whatever. Uh, uh, sort of truculent policies a conservative president's going to trot out. Um, now, I, I wanted to ask you something about about uh, the, the the kind of split um, in the sort of broad libertarian coalition over the current war uh, in, in Iraq, uh, which was pretty salient. There, there are a number of uh, fairly prominent libertarian types. Uh, like Glenn Reynolds, who runs Instapundit, who is uh, libertarian on most issues, who were very hawkish. Um, uh, uh, maybe someone else who fits that profile would be like uh, Andrew Sullivan, who's fairly libertarian, but he was fairly hawkish at the beginning, was in favor of invading Iraq. And even some members of the Cato Institute, like my boss, Brink Lindsay, was in favor of the war uh, initially. Um, now, uh, w and it seems like there is this division that's kind of the, that has opened up since the beginning of the war between uh, what I see as a sort of more tr traditionalist, in fact, uh, anti-war libertarianism, and a kind of um, very sort of rah-rah pro-American kind of libertarianism. That uh, that I, I, I wonder how these things sort of relate to the history. And I'll give you my. Uh, Quick conjecture, sure. which is which is that part that 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 the, the sort of coalition of the right and 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 libertarianism during the sort of anti-communist era um, kind of created this very strong sense that America was the kind of bastion and beacon of freedom around the right. world, and you and this is very strong in like Ayn Rand, as you said, like sure. because the U.S. is sort of more or less the freest thing going, they have a certain kind of special moral obligation to um, defend freedom worldwide. Um, but, I, but, but, that, but that strikes me as, as having a kind of, there's a tension in that kind of view where on the one hand you're anti-statist, but you're, you're in love with America. Right. Um, and... and and it, seem, and it seems like the, and, and I think a lot of sort of uh, the libertarians of reason are a little have a, a somewhat more cosmopolitan view of things. Like you, you know, love America insofar as America uh, exemplifies certain kinds of ideals that are important to libertarians. Um, but what's important is freedom generally, and uh, there's nothing special like about the U.S. And and I feel I feel like. Like when I get into conversations with some people who profess to be libertarians, they have a very, very deep attachment to, uh, you know, the American flag and the American nation in a way that seems not really that libertarian to me. I wonder if you could just comment on my conjecture there. Both, um, both of those strains have have run through uh, the movement ever since its beginning. Uh, Murray Rothbard, I say, would be the emblematic figure of the, uh, the uh, screw America. This is, you know, all about the, the international uh, libertarian uh, revolution kind of attitude, but a peaceful revolution. Yeah. But as, as I start my book, it, it, it really is true that libertarians can, can find a very usable past in the American founding, at least, that... Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy to argue that America, you know, the American Constitution represents some very libertarian principles, that uh, the world as a whole is a, is a freer place because of things America has done, even some, some things like overseas military interventions. You know, it's certainly, it's a very hard thing to argue, as many libertarians argued uh, before and during World War II, that 
uh, the United States maybe shouldn't have been involved in World War II at all, and that right. is definitely something that many libertarians believed at the time. Um, and, you know, talk about lost causes. So uh, using that same kind of historical thing, people can go, well, uh, you know, we may feel that overseas intervention is uh, violates libertarian principles for this reason or that reason, but... Uh, if you look 30 years down the line and the Middle East is a wealthier, freer, happier place, you know, who's t who's to say it wasn't worth it? And I, I, I think that kind of attitude underlies the libertarian leaning who, who do believe that some good can come of uh, our current Middle East adventurism. Uh, on a more simpler level, you'll hear the argument that, well, is libertarianism about liberty, the concept of liberty worldwide, or is it this, uh, you know, crabbed, cranky, I've got mine, Jack, attitude, uh, and they somehow mm -hmm. believe that uh, war, you know, eternal war is actually a great way to in increase uh, uh, liberty uh, across the world, and if you can posit that, then libertarians have to be for the great uh, neocon, you know, march <laughs> to bring uh, democracy for the world. So there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of practical arguments have to be brought to bear. You mm -hmm. have to go, well, what is actually uh, going to happen? Uh, what's happening in the short term? What's happening in the long term? I, as a more moralistic uh, libertarian, am, am willing to concede, as I and I think it is true, that um, 25 years from now, mm -hmm. I'm willing to bet, or, or you know, even less than the distance between now and World War II, that Iraq is probably going to be a much more prosperous, happy, and free place than it was under Saddam Hussein. Um, that does not mean that I believe that the means, A, that that wouldn't have been the case regardless of whether the U.S. had happened to go to war there, or B, that that somehow uh, justifies it. But I, I really think I, as, that's... As, as Mike Gravel, I think, pointed out, we lost the Vietnam War, but you can still go to a Starbucks there. Exactly. Um, and I, I really think history really is a friend to the pro-war people because, you know, after we've all forgotten all the people who died and all the buildings have been rebuilt and everything, it's like, well, the world's kind of marched on and it's, re it's better really, isn't it? Uh, yeah. It's like, yeah, but that, you know, that to me that's that's never been sufficient excuse for, for uh, the means of, of warfare. And I, I, I hope that was directly responsive to... Uh, to what you're saying, but but certainly uh, it's long been an accusation of libertarians, especially of the Rothbardian strain, that they hate the U.S. more than they love liberty. The the Randians have thrown that accusation at uh, the Rothbardians uh, and, and at some others. Um, uh, you'll often hear them argue that well, the, the the U.S. is is the state that they live under and have to deal with, and it makes more sense that they're spending their time railing against the problems and evils of the U.S. government as opposed to spending their time railing against the problems. Here's, here's, here's one more th thought about that, and uh, it might have to be one of the last ones, uh, is that my, my, my sense is that some, um, some American uh, libertarians, um, maybe Ron Paul is one of them, who are uh, very strongly um, anti-immigration, for mm -hmm. instance, uh, have this sort of idea that the American nation state is kind of like a parcel of property yeah. that is jointly ours. Yeah. And and if you believe in the, the, the like, sovereignty is kind of like a property, right? Like, get off my land. Right. And, and we, as a people, can decide who gets to come onto our land or not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, I think that's fundamentally mistaken. I think a nation state isn't anything like a piece of land, and I don't actually think that there's a good moral argument for keeping... Uh, anyone out uh, except to sort of maintain public order in a sort of minimal way. So I'm one of those crazy open borders sorts of people. Um, but I think uh, there's a sort of an easy, there's, a, there's an easy um, analogy between seeing a nation state, seeing borders uh, on the uh, model of a fence around a parcel of property. Yeah. And that if you care about property rights, then you care about the ability of a people to be sovereign over the territory that uh, that that uh, that is theirs. Um, yeah. This. Um, uh, go on. No, that, that 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 was my whole thought. Okay. Yeah. There's uh, as as you may or may not know. There's a, there's a sort of anarcho Rothbardian uh, economist named Hans Hermann Hoppe who developed uh, the sort of anarcho capitalist explanation for why we can't have <laughs> have free immigration, uh, which roughly goes along the lines of well, in a world of complete private property, uh, 
there's no such thing as, as a right to really move anywhere without the permission of, of property owners. And, of course, most people understand that uh, in any world made up of human beings as we understand them of pure private property, there would be every allowance made for you know easements uh, and, and mm-hmm. the like. Uh, but um, he argued that. And, okay, we're not in an anarcho-utopia yet, but... To the best of its ability, the U.S. government should act like a private property owner and thus keep all the riffraff riffraff out. And uh, um, apparently some some people of the anarcho-Rothbardian stripe have found that convincing. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, who have strong, uh, you know, I'm I'm as much a Rothbardian as uh, as I am, you know, any anything within the larger libertarian coalition, but I've never found that uh, convincing. Uh, uh, Ron Paul, I don't think, comes from that kind of argument, Mm -hmm. but Ron Paul just sort of culturally uh, has this right populist strain in him, which Mm -hmm. is not surprising as a Republican, successful Republican congressman from Texas, which combines a extremely... Uh, an extreme belief in the Constitution, uh, an extreme belief, uh, skepticism about the federal government, with certain cultural associations that have traditionally not really accrued to self-identified libertarians. Mm-hmm. One of them is about sovereignty in general. It's like a libertarian. Most libertarians are like, well, sovereignty is a personal thing. It's not right. a national thing. But he worries about it nationally, as you mentioned, which makes him really upset about the UN and the North mm-hmm. American Union. I mean, most mm-hmm. libertarians don't like the UN, but it's not usually... Right. an issue that really makes us grit our teeth with, with anger, um, but mm-hmm. it does what we're on. Um, well, it, it just shows that, it t- that, that even among libertarians, there's a huge amount of diversity, that it takes sure. all kinds, that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm one of those people who actually, you know, I'm, what, what my utopian vision is a sort of uh, a federated humanity that's linked together by, you know, free trade and free labor migration right. networks. And so I actually like the idea of a North American union that would that allow was, um, for... That's absolutely traditional movement libertarianism because both mm-hmm. Mises and Hayek uh, believe that as well. They were, you know, they. I don't want to give uh, weapons to uh, right wing enemies, but Mises and Hayek were both the bleeding heart one world governmenters. They mm-hmm. were, but they believed it should be a one world classical liberal uh, government. Mm-hmm. Well, that's where I'm at. I think we're out of time, uh, Brian. Uh, that was. Th- thank you so much. There's so much uh, in your book that we weren't able to touch on, but. Uh, Again, for the viewers, if you're interested in uh, lots of the uh, sort of crazy characters and fascinating uh, sort of philosophical history uh, in the uh, uh, in the in the history of libertarianism, I enjoy uh, and, you know implore you to check it out. It's a it's a wonderful book. Uh, and thanks for uh, coming on to talk about it, Brian. Will, thank you so much. It's been great. All right, take care.